I remember when the, when the bank started failing last year. Well, it's not looking good again. So here's why the S&P cut outlook for five U.S. regional banks with heavy commercial real estate exposure. UBS flags commercial real estate downturn as a top risk. Here it is. Why S&P cut outlook for five. Here it is. Five smaller U.S. banks with exposure to commercial real estate have been hit with a credit rating outlook downgrades. The latest development threatening to make borrowing more difficult for businesses and individuals. S&P Global Ratings downgraded its ratings outlook on five regional lenders late Tuesday to negative from stable while affirming their ratings. So here's the five banks. Okay. Their ratings agency said that five were among the most exposed to commercial real estate in its coverage and that the downgrades reflect the possibility that stress in the sector could hurt the asset quality and performance of these regional banks. What it means is that they are too heavily, they put too much money and loaned out too much money to commercial real estate, which is sitting empty now since COVID. And so that's all that means. And so they're not going to be able to get their money back. And so the people right. are going to default on those loans and they're going to be out. That's what that means. Loans on investor-owned commercial real estate, multifamily and construction and development properties made up between roughly 25 and 55% of these banks lending as of the end of 2023. The ratings agency said that while the cuts in interest rates by the Federal Reserve could alleviate some of the stress in the commercial real estate and reduce the risk of rush of soured loans, higher for longer interest rates also pose a risk. Right. So it's you get a hit with both fists. So the S and P said it now has negative outlooks due to sizable commercial real estate exposure on nine of the U.S. banks, or eighteen percent of its lenders. So that's like almost twenty percent of banks are have negative outlooks. Doesn't sound yeah. good. It sounds scary to me. It sounds like there's some well, here's what here's what you say about it. Here's your substack, the Fed, commercial real estate, and me. Let's take a look at what the Federal Reserve has been up to lately. It doesn't make me feel great. Honestly, it's not just a hunch. The signs are all over the place, kind of like deja vu from those dicey days before the 2007 financial meltdown. I remember those days. The Fed was urging back then, back then in 2007, the Fed was urging all banks to borrow money directly from the Fed so it wouldn't be alarming if just your bank was forced to borrow from the Fed because banks borrow from each other overnight. And some, and so, but they wanted to stop that back in 2007 and they wanted all the banks just to borrow from the Fed. Uh, because if banks, when in need of funds, have mostly always been able to borrow from other banks and suddenly, those banks get turned down, trying to make it seem okay for the ones really in trouble to do the same, and it masks masking from us which banks were in trouble. So, right. so when certain banks are in trouble and then they can't get credit from their local from other banks, they have to go to the Fed, and then everybody knows they're in trouble when they have to go to the Fed. So the Fed was like, "Hey, no, no everybody now, just come to us." So we can hide the which banks are in trouble. They did that in 2007. And then you know what happened. We had the right. biggest crash of my lifetime. Well, that was 2007 to 2011 per a report I can send you uh, for anyone who requests. Today, it's happening again. So, Paul, they're doing so the Fed is telling people to borrow from the Fed again instead of each other. Right. There's reports that are coming out where the Fed policy has shifted to invite all financial institutions, you know, all bank lenders that uh, need overnight funds or temporary funds to borrow directly from the Federal Reserve instead of borrowing from each other. So it's a sign of, you know, when we look around at the world and you see all the trillions of dollars that are being created out of thin air, just notice if, if this is confusing to folks or it's a bit overwhelming, just notice that that isn't solving any problems. We've got the ratings agencies that are that are you know bringing attention to be that we should be concerned about the uh, viability of banks that are heavily uh, uh, positioned for commercial for the uh, commercial real estate space and how that's not going so well and then that causes uh, the domino effect to go on because it's money flow that is the issue. And how is there not enough money in the world today with the trillions of dollars that have been created, right? So 
when we look at the deficit that keeps rising and Congress, you know, argues like a daycare over raising the debt ceiling from time to time, and they've had to pass these little temporary measures five times, I think, in the last year to keep the government funded and keep the lights on. The real thought for those watching is, how do I know the retirement savings that I've built together that I'm counting on being there for me now that I'm retired or soon to be retired stays mine? You, right. How you can't, right? Because if people remember, I I I was a, I was a grown up back then. I remember people. There was news story after news story of people saying that I was getting ready to retire, and now my four hundred one k is gone, and that's what happens, right? And so, I didn't want to live through that. I don't want to have to go to sleep worrying if I'm going to wake up and my retirement is gone. I'd rather stick my retirement money in a mattress then stick it into Wall Street and have to worry about it like that. And yeah. so that's what led me to talk to you. That's what led. And again, I'm not get, getting any, anybody what to do with your money. I'm just telling you what I'm doing with my money. And um, I, uh, everybody I talk to uh, thinks there's a big crash coming. You think there's a crash coming. This That's what this says to me. 20% of banks are... Uh, in a bad position because of their, so do you, so this commercial real estate, Paul. So now after COVID it's sitting empty, right? So there's these, there's all these office space and what have you that is sitting empty because people are working remotely and nobody wants to go back to the office. Uh, what is going to happen with that? I mean, how, how is it that there's still, there's all this empty, Commercial real estate, say for instance in San Francisco, yet the property values stay inflated. How? How do you have any in, in, insight into that? Well, uh, you know, there's two different parts, major parts to the real estate market. There's the residential and then the commercial space. Um, I would assume that keeping asset values, uh, especially in the commercial space, elevated uh, helps things to continue to look viable, or at least. Uh, uh, you know, that the damage isn't really taking its toll yet. In the residential space, you know, when Bill Clinton was president, he created an opportunity for the banks to lend 10 times the amount of money they're sitting on to help create additional liquidity for those who didn't have the most perfect credit rating to also own a part of the American dream, own a home. Uh, when you see just everywhere, everything we're talking about, you see that there just still isn't enough money. There still isn't enough money. We're 34 trillion in debt and a trillion in new debt created every 100 days. There's still not enough money. Um, when we look at the, the specifics of the topic we're in right now and folks that might find that overwhelming again or confusing, just keep asking yourself, well, when does this turn a corner? You know, I, I'm I'm very appreciative to those fans in Detroit that were rooting for the Lions all these seasons. There were many seasons where they hardly won a game and they stuck with it and their team did extraordinarily well last year. But rooting for something doesn't necessarily mean it affects anything. And when we're looking at mathematical issues, which is what I always try to focus on, only great math turns around ugly math. And printing money is not good math. So everywhere you look, you see a shortage of liquidity. That's what we're reading about. If banks are struggling to keep their doors open, and I'm not saying that any in particular are, I'm not a financial expert in that regard. I'm just a common person who likes to study this, this uh, subject and, and try to help people uh, become aware of things they should be looking into for themselves and asking questions uh, for themselves to find those answers. Is that uh, when did the government come and rescue you something for real? When did great math solve the ugly mathematics the government created? It isn't going to come from the government. So you know how they kept interest. So, so after the 2008 crash, they kept interest rates. At zero at, for oh, almost 10 years. Pretty much at zero for 10 years. Right. So. And that because was, unemployment skyrocketed true unemployment. Think about your engine, right? You have uh, the pistons are like swinging hammers under the hood. You know, I like a good eight cylinder. You know, I'm a country guy. I want an eight cylinder truck. And uh, what if you lost two cylinders? What if two quit firing? Now you're down to six. Now the vehicle doesn't run as well. 
So the swinging hammers in your economy, the employees, the workers, are always going to be the truth in whether your economy is doing well or not. And if you rise up to 25% unemployment, then you're going to have to start creating money from somewhere else for the economy to pay its bills, for Washington to cover the cost to run America Incorporated. And that's why the debt skyrocketed. You know, the first the first issuance of this is the retirees, the baby boomers beginning to retire in 97. Our national debt at the time was around four trillion. Today it's 34 trillion. The dollar is worth 56 cents. Today it's worth three cents. So I like to drive attention towards resources. If banks are needing money from each other and then they can't lend to each other, they have to go to the Fed because the Fed has more resources than any individual financial institution. Right. If printing money has been the resource we're drawing on to keep the lights on in the economy for tomorrow, and that resource is practically, you know, is down by 97 percent of what it was once worth, then folks have to start asking themselves about the location of their savings and what makes them feel comfortable. And there's nothing wrong with continuing to believe that, you know, the way you've been doing things forever is going to be OK, because this is America. But. When it comes to being aware of how this gets fixed, I'm trying to draw some attention to the fact that it looks like rearranging furniture on the Titanic. And so, and you notice that the Fed is starting to, so to, to me, this is a, a big thing that people don't talk about, that um, the Fed's started to tell banks Again, to start coming to us. For, and by the way, the Fed is a private institution. I for, I all my whole life thought the Fed, if they, it's called the Fed. I right. thought it was part of the government. It's not. It's not part of the government. It's a private institution. So what they're doing is they're now telling other banks to come. Come when you need to borrow money, come to us. Don't go to each other. And what that does is mask the reality of which banks are actually in trouble. So if everybody so they're doing that again. That's what the reports are showing. Yes. Yes. And, you know, there was a good point made that we made a few weeks ago that we didn't touch on very heavily. But um, at COVID, there's a report out there. This is all stuff we can read that we can find, you know, on our own uh, uh, searching for things is that the Fed reduced the need to hold the reserve. So what, what if, does that mean? If it well, if it, you know, like a buffer money, like having a shock absorber. You mean so for banks? Uh, so banks don't. So so banks have to have at least ten percent of the money on reserve that they have loaned out, right? Well, I don't know if that's true anymore. The reports that I read at the onset of COVID, the Fed dropped that to zero, zero requirements. Because no, no. I, the, well, the idea is that the Fed can backstop anything, but I just look to the resource they draw on to be able to backstop things, and that's the dollar, and the dollar's worth three cents, and it used to be worth a hundred cents. So, so how much longer can this policy stay in place? So, by the way, how long ago? So, was the dollar? When was the dollar worth a hundred cents? When it was backed by gold, all the years leading up to 1933. Okay. Now, I thought we didn't go off the gold standard until like 70 some One. 71. Right. So, That's when it became a free for all. So, why wasn't it worth a hundred cents in 71 if it was still backed by gold? They would raise gold's price and then print the money that equated the difference. So in 33, we're in the Depression. And I hope people find this interesting. I love history. That's why I like talking about it. I think the source of things really, really matters. And where we're coming from helps us understand where we're headed. So in the Depression, uh, four years into the Depression, life's very, very difficult. The economist must have told Roosevelt, if we can create $5 billion, now just hear that number, $5 billion is all they needed to come out of the Depression. You know, Jeff Bezos could write that check 30 times today. If you think about the scale of how big and large the government and its issues have become since 90 years ago. Uh, but they can't print money because they're on the gold standard. So they say, hey, turn in your gold. We'll give you the 20 bucks an ounce for it. You know, no harm, no foul. And then they raised gold's value from 20 to 35. That would have diluted your savings. I always have a saying of a lot of them. One is when the government loses, you certainly lose. But it allowed them by raising gold from 20 to 35 an ounce to print 5 billion bucks. And out of the Great Depression, we started to come. Eventually, they raised it to $50. And eventually, it was higher than that. Every time they would raise gold's value would dilute your savings, but allowed them to print money and do some things they had ideas about doing. But, but not having all the money in the world until 1971 is when it became a free-for-all. That's where they just print it well. 
because the just think of gold as a restriction. It's like a a limit. And if if you if you el- remove the limit ounces of gold in the vault, then you can print and create all the money you want at will. And that's how we get to thirty four trillion dollars in federal debt. And it doesn't look to me like any financial issues have been resolved from all that money creation. Okay. Well, um, I, again, I'm not a I'm not a financial guy. I just uh, have gut feelings about things. Um, every one of my gut feelings has turned out to be correct. <laughs> I just uh, wish they could come to the podium and tell us the truth. Like what, that's what I wish. What, what, like what, top, what 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 would what do you think? What would that look like if they did? Like what are you, you looking? What, could, what kind it, of truth are you looking for? Well, if they could have the ability to come to the podium and say, my fellow Americans, we need to tighten our belts. Things are very ugly out there. COVID dealt one hell of a blow to things. If you guys want to run and uh, protect your savings, we understand. But why don't we stay in this fight together? It doesn't matter what color we are or how old we are, or if we're fit or overweight or young or old or smart or genius. We need to bind together and face these challenges as one. I wish that they could come and tell us the truth instead of treating us like little kids and we can't be told certain things or it will ruin their little party. You mean like which banks are having to borrow from the Fed and which banks aren't? And Right. And what it really means when you print a trillion dollars in debt every hundred days. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. All right. Well, so uh, do you expect them to cut in- interest rates? What's your prediction? Uh they say they're going to cut it by the end of the year. Do you think they will? So the wonderful uh, policy that has helped buoy uh, the United States economy from going off the rails or going into a grave um, was always an honest assessment of what's reasonable. Bringing rates to zero is putting both feet on the gas pedal and going as fast as you can. Does that seem reasonable? Does any extreme seem reasonable? So when you look back over U.S. history, just look at the chart. I think I have it there in my article, if you, if it's convenient to grab. It just shows that rates were generally around 5 or 6% as an average. Having them at zero says we're in trouble. And it also says that um, I'm sure Wall Street loves all the funding that it can get because that causes things to, to rise in value. Um, I wish the days weren't gone or seem to be gone uh, where uh, reasonableness and and not yielding, uh, swinging from one extreme to the other was the norm. So rates at zero means a free for all for those who who make a, a great return from, uh, you know, from Wall Street. But it continues to gut the value of your currency. And yeah, OK. And that's why, and, and also 0% interest rates discourage savings, right? Absolutely, right. It, it encourages risk or almost forces you into risk. You know, one way to compare this, folks, is just to think, how much is drinking water from the Park, park Fountain, right? Would you rather have an Evian or, you know, an Arrowhead or a bottled water of any kind that might have been filtered instead of running through rusty pipes at the park? So if interest rates are at zero, it means the dollar has no respect. There's no respect for the dollar. What value is there when something is free? Hardly anything, right? If you want to pay a little bit to borrow the dollar, rates should be higher than zero. People asking for rates to drop sends a signal to me that they're extremely concerned that there's a wall we are going to hit someday. And the only way to avoid that is to make borrowing the dollar free. So I've talked to several people and uh, they think that, of course, this our our economy is being artificially propped up, and they're gonna they're absolutely gonna, they're gonna try and make it to the election, and that's what the big deal is. So, uh, if uh, so, at least they could get Biden elected, and if they can't, they then when it crashes, they can blame it on Trump anyway. That's what I've been told. Anyway, so we'll see. Uh, I, I'm I've always hated Wall Street. I've always hated putting my money. In a in that kind of uh, instrument, you know, uh, where they take my money and they put it in uh, into Wall Street, I hate I hate that. Um, it it there was a time when that made all the sense in the world. I I think that time is over. But again, I'm not a financial genius, but I can tell you this: I can tell you that commercial real estate 
is sitting empty. I can tell you that the bank twenty per, almost twenty percent of American banks overexposed with um, or over heavily ex- uh, invested or 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 at risk of. Uh, of losing all that money that they have lent out for commercial real estate. And uh, okay. now the Fed is telling people to come borrow from them again. It's a lot It's a lot of the same symptoms uh, that we saw back in 2007. So, and just last, remember last year when all those banks uh, needed all that cash in for, remember people were going nuts for at least a week or two. And um, well, we'll see what happens. Listen, Paul, thank you for, uh, thanks for talking with us. Uh, anything you want to add before we say goodbye? I just love, uh, you know, that hosts like yourself uh, that encourage people to look and and think for themselves, ask great questions. I always say that the questions mean more than the answers because the answers will come. Let's spend some time asking questions about all this. And that's all I'm trying to do is help illuminate things for folks that may not have time to spend hours a day researching things like we do. And all so this, I want to say thank you to you. You're welcome. And all this stuff is this isn't like some insider stuff. This is all publicly available information. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Paul Stone uh, is co-founder, CEO, of Colonial Metals Group, an advertiser on the show. I always like to let people know that. Uh, but uh, uh, do what you want. I don't. I'm not telling anybody to do to do anything. I'm just telling people these are the questions I have. These are the these are the signs I see, and let you know what I'm doing. You do what you you like. Everybody talk to whoever you want to talk to. All right, Paul. We're gonna take a break. Thanks for coming on, pal. We'll see you soon. You know what my theory is, is that there's a huge crash coming. It's coming. And so I'm putting my money into precious metals, mostly gold. And so I, I have a, I have a substantial percentage of my retirement in gold. And uh, my financial future is secure with gold and silver. That's why I decided to sponsor and I partnered with Colonial Metals Group. Uh, they helped me set up a safe and secure self-directed IRA where I have access to my assets, no matter what the stock market or for that, for that matter, whatever the government's doing, I have access to it. And I plus I got it in gold coins. Okay. So let the team of experts at colonial metals group, help you protect your family's future. We put together a special off list of this offer. You click on the link in the description of this video or call the special 800 number, and you're going to receive a safe and up to $10,000 in free silver. I don't know how they could do that, but go to colonialmetalsgroup.com slash Jimmy Dore Show. Colonialmetals.com slash Jimmy dash door dash show. Or you can call 888-910-1419. That's 888-910-1419. And a nice person like our friend Paul from Colonial, he'll tell you all about it. I had lunch with Paul when he explained all this to me. I was like, hey, I'd like to work with you guys. And I'd like to put my my retirement money in an IRA account with you guys with the precious metals. So go to uh, 888-910-1419. That's Colonial Predal- Colonial Metals. Or you can go to colonialmetalsgroup.com slash jimmy dash store dash show. Or click the link in the description. Hey, there's still tickets available in Stockholm, Oslo, Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, Cortland, New York, Oakmont, Pennsylvania, El Paso, Texas, San Antonio, Texas, Edmonton, Alberta, Vancouver, British Columbia, Denver, Ashland, Virginia, and Athens, Georgia. See you there. (laughs) 